Evelyn, thank you very much for your remarks. Um, and uh, let me say that it's very appropriate that the, the weather's 1870 weather. <laughs> Talking about John Stuart Mill, who passed away in 1873, you would, you would like the idea that the atmosphere is a million. And I also thank you for reminding me about the fact that I was the author of a book on Adam Smith. Because uh, when Adam Smith was about two thirds of my present age, he <coughs> pretended to have forgotten to have ever written a book on the wealth of nations. But well, I'd forgotten I'd written a book on Adam Smith <laughs> till Evelyn reminded me. And um, my talk is entitled John Stuart Mill and the Jewish Question. It's not totally accurate. It should have been John Stuart Mill and the Irish Question, but arose by any other name. You'll understand what I'm alluding to by the time I, re I reach the end, at least I hope so. Um, this is a rather emotional topic for me. I live uh, in a Judean desert, about um, 10 kilometers from the Palestinian territories. So when I look out of my, my, my window, I can see the desert, and I know on the other side of the ridge, there's a different world. So this is very meaningful for me. And, um, I hope I'm not going to get into trouble. Let me start off by way of introduction, referring to a book by a certain Edward Alexander, who wrote a book on the state of the Jews, a critical appraisal recently. And he asserts that John Stuart Mill was neither anti-Semite nor philo-Semite, but a tertium quid, like a third party, foreshadowing a political type of more immediacy to my subject than the two Arnolds themselves. Now, by the two Arnolds is intended, the one that interests me is the first one, not, not, the, not the second one. He meant Thomas, headmaster of rugby school, who explained to a correspondent in 1834 that he must petition against the Jew Bill because it is based on that low Jacobinical notion of citizenship that a man acquires a right to it by the accident of his being littered into Quator Maria, being littered, that is to say, on the nation's soil, or because he pays taxes. Um, the Jew Bill was the Jewish Emancipation Bill, rejected by the House of Lords in 1833 and reintroduced unsuccessfully in 1834. The proposal included release of Jews elected to Parliament from the obligation to take a Christian oath before they could take their seats. Um, now, let me just say one word about, um, about Thomas Arnold. He objected to the bill, as he explained, because he wanted to avoid an indiscriminate mixture of races. He wanted to keep the Jews out. He was willing, he explains to a correspondence, to let Jews tax themselves in a Jewish house of assembly, like a colony but to confound the right of taxing oneself with the right of general legislation is low, is low Jacobinism, what we would call left wing. Now, um, this will prove, this introduction will prove appropriate later, pertinent later on. The other thing I should mention by way of introduction is this, that by the contention that Mill foreshadowed a certain political type, Alexander intends modern-day Israel's ideological enemies who have long done battle with that straw man they call Zionists who want to silence all criticism of Israel, which he regards as mythical creatures. They don't exist, according to Alexander. Mythical creatures nobody has ever been able to identify. A reviewer of this book observes fairly regarding the critical appraisal of the subtitle that Alexander's animus is directed exclusively against the disparagement of Israel issuing from anti-Semites and liberal diaspora dupes. He should have added liberal Israeli dupes, actually. So this is the theme. I mean, academics like to have um, pegs to hang, hang things on, and Alexander is a very excellent peg from my point of view. To make any sense at all of Alexander's perception of John Stuart Mill as a surrogate for modern-day critics of Israel requires distinguishing between the facts of the case, 
whether Israeli policy, government or civil, engages in discrimination against the non-Jewish minority and desirable policy or principles of good governance. For there are those who recognize the justice of the principle of non-discrimination and insist that actual Israeli policy does live up to that principle, or at least tries to do so, and those who adopt the same principle but believe that Israel systematically contravi contravenes it. Now, much of my discussion identifies the principle of equality with non-discrimination against minorities. The moral issue is, of course, exacerbated where the colonialist treatment of majorities by the minority is entailed, and I'll come to that later on. <clears throat> now, what though of Mill? Could honest critics of Israeli policy, I, I don't say, I have to be careful here, sensitive issue, I don't say critics of Israel, I say critics of Israeli policy. Could honest critics find comfort in his stance regarding the principle of equality? Um, Alexander evidently does perceive him as prey to anti-Jewish prejudice, whatever label we might choose to apply, so that his writings could be put to the service of disingenuous critics of the Jewish state, including Jews of the so-called self-hating variety. But honest critics would not be able to derive support from Mill. The evidence I shall bring, in fact, allows honest critics to rest assured that they are following in Mill's footsteps. Let me first then, following this introduction, say something about Mill on Judaism and ethical progress. I call attention first to a private communication by Mill in 1842, affirming his chord with a book by F.D. Morris, an article actually, Moral and Metaphysical Philosophy but expecting Morris to be somewhat taken aback. I agree, he wrote, to a much greater extent than you would perhaps suppose, in your view, even of the historical position of the Jews. I shall cite one characteristic passage from Morris that Mill might have had in mind. He talks there of students, Bible students, having failed to examine steadily those mosaic institutions and trying to consider what information they give us respecting the grounds of national and social life. Our conviction is that there can be no clear understanding of the principles of political order as they existed in Greece and Rome, and as they do exist in modern Europe, until the constitution of this divine commonwealth is mediated upon in an honest and humble spirit. Now, Mill then went on to admit, having once entertained what he calls crude notions regarding the Jews, many of which he had abandoned on encountering a book by Joseph Salvador, L'Histoire des Institutions de Moïse et du Peuple Hébreu, History of Mosaical Institutions and the Hebrew People, 1828. And Mill writes, I believe I was cured of many of my crude notions about them by the writings of Salvador, a Jew by race and by national feeling, a Frenchman by birth, and a rationalist of the school of H.E.J. Paulus. I noted proviso by Mill that Salvador's account was somewhat ludicrous in its adaptation of Moses to a Voltairean public and its attempt to prove that the Jews were constitutional liberals and utilitarians. Nevertheless, Mill writes, it was so full of strong facts and even arguments that it made a great impression on me when I read it a year or two ago, that would have been about 1840. Earlier the same year, Mill had written to Gustave Dechtal, and although Salvador's book had been too much affected by contemporary French events, it had transformed his perceptions. It has thrown much new light upon history, and has made me think in a manner I never expected to do of the Hebrew people and polity. But, he says, I could hardly help laughing at the manner in which he strains everything to recommend poor Moses to the constitutional opposition and to show that the Jews were liberals, political economists and utilitarians and that they had, properly speaking, no religion or next to none and were altogether à la hauteur de l'époque, worthy sons of the 18th century. Now, when, when he says he can't help laughing, 
I have difficulty to imagine because I can't imagine Mill ever laughing. If you look at, the <laughs> <laughs> if you look at his severe picture on the cover. But this is the kind of thing he might have laughed about if he was going to laugh. Uh, I know of no other indication by Mill himself of his earlier crude views, that's his word, than that mentioned in the September letter. But I take him at his word, including the admission that he had entertained such views until the encounter with Salvador in 1840. As for a residue of prejudice implied in this disavowal, I am inclined to believe that Mill's confession should not be read literally since one does not normally admit to retaining crude notions. Nevertheless, several of his objections to the Old Testament as a primitive document, even after reading Salvador, do, I think, lack balance, while an evident unawareness of centuries, or rather getting on for millennia of rabbinical interpretation, constitutes, to my mind, a weakness. To the extent that Mill did retain a biased view in the historical context, however, I find that his ability to approach the contemporary Jewish question sym sympathetically which I document later on, I find that to be all the more impressive. Let me be more specific. <clears throat> Keep an eye on the watch. No, it's not that I'd written, I'd written down. I know what the time is, <laughs> but I'd written down how long each part going to take me. <laughs> and I forgot about it. <laughs> okay, I'll just have to hope for the best. Let me be more specific. In 1835, Mill opined that the guidance in the details of ethics or a code of morals provided by Judaism was but local and temporary rather than universally applicable. And in later correspondence, he strikingly lamented how can morality be anything but the chaos it now is when the ideas of right and wrong, just and unjust, must be wrenched into accordance, either with the notions of a, <laughs> of a tribe of barbarians in the corner of Syria 3,000 years ago, or with what is called the order of providence? Now that sounds pretty anti-Old Testament, but I'll make the point later on that in fact it's written in the context of a criticism of Christianity, where he's saying that Christian ethics is based on this barbaric Old, <laughs> Old Testament. So it has, it's a double-edged thing. On liberty refers to the ethical doctrine of the Bible as a system elaborate indeed, but in many respects barbarous, and indeed only, <laughs> only for a barbarous people. Uh, utilitarianism refers to the idée mère, the primitive element in the formation of justice namely conformity to law, which constitutes the entire idea among the Hebrews up to the birth of Christianity, as might be expected in the case of a people whose laws attempted to embrace all subjects on which precepts were required, rules and regulations, and who believed those laws to be a direct emanation from the supreme being. Mill goes on to argue that the Greeks and Romans were more advanced by opening the door for law reform. What particularly troubled Mill regarding the Hebrew law was the lex talionis, or the law of retaliation. No, he says, no rule on this subject recommends itself so strongly to the primitive and spontaneous sentiment of justice as the lex talionis, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Though this principle of the Jewish and of the Mohammedan law has been generally abandoned, in Europe, as a practical maxim, maxim, there is, I suspect, in most minds a, se a secret hankering after it. <laughs> when people say that most people think that way, they're really talking about themselves. Mill was apparently unaware, and this is my criticism of him, of the ethical root, ru rulings in the Old Testament of undoubted universal and permanent relevance encapsulated, for example, by the seven Noahide commandments enjoined upon all mankind but all, in fact extending much further to encompass, for example, restrictions on property rights, fair treatment of aliens, an injunction against the return to their masters of escaped slaves, animal welfare, and public hygiene. Salvador lists some of these items. Um, I don't remember which ones. 
uh, but uh, his statement elicited mockery on Mill's part. As for the Lex Talionis, Mill bases himself on a literal reading of the biblical text, ignoring rabbinical interpretation that runs in terms of monetary compensation for injury, although admittedly it is no easy matter to discern whether the rabbis intended to soften the harshness of the original or whether they believed that monetary compensation was the actual intention of the lawgiver. More generally, Mill ignored entirely the fact that social utility was a prime consideration governing the rabbinical contribution to practical Jewish law. And when Mill does recognize aspects of the broader picture, it is sometimes in a manner so ungracious as to suggest a degree of prejudice, and to that extent Alexander would have reason to object. I refer to a note regarding the commandment to love one another, as found in John, where Mill reminds readers that this is not, however, a new commandment. In justice to the great Hebrew lawgiver, it should always be remembered that the precept to love thy neighbor as thyself already existed in the Pentateuch. And very, <laughs> very surprising it is to find it there. <laughs> and then similarly, <laughs> similarly ungenerous is his declaration that the Stoics were, I believe, the first except as far as the Jewish law constitutes an exception, who taught as a part of morality that men were bound by moral obligations to their slaves. Now, why the qualification? Now, Mill himself, um, we recall, had affirmed in 1842 that he had abandoned many, not all, of his admitted biases regarding the Jews upon encountering Joseph Salvador. So perhaps we shouldn't be so surprised to encounter residual instances of prejudice. But here we must step back and be cautious, for the fact is that Mill also expressed simultaneously fulsome appreciation for the advance of humanity by the ancient Hebrews. Thus the reflection that their perceiving law as emanating from the supreme being and accordingly as necessarily just which precluded any notion of the progress of mankind, did not prevent Mill from applauding the transition to monotheism. As such, miraculous is the enthusiastic term used, and while regretting the failure of the Hebrews to remain faithful to the principle, he acknowledged that such lapses could be understood as reflecting the real mental difficulties impeding its adoption. He actually talks about a tradition of monotheism which was lost, uh, by all the nations of the world except a small and peculiar people in whom it was miraculously kept alive. But beyond this, uh, an, admira an admiration for the Hebrew prophets constitutes a veritable transformation in the view taken of early Judaism. Here Joseph Salvador again plays a part, as is clear from Mill's letter to Gustav Dechtal, which I referred to earlier. He is quite right, he wrote, in saying that the liberty of prophesying was equivalent in the Jewish polity to the liberty of the press, and the point is a new and striking one. And Mill actually underscores the religious dimension against Salvador, who wished to remove it entirely. Why not say at once, Mill wrote in his comments on Salvador, why not say at once that all persons of genius inspired persons in the modern sense, poets and persons of imagination and eloquence, who had great and wonderful powers not derived from teaching, were believed to derive these powers straight from God, and were in consequence of that religious belief, permitted from religious motives to exercise that right of free speech and free censure of powerful persons, which certainly would not in that age have been conceded to anyone who spoke merely as from himself. Going yet further than the correspondence or passages from representative government where the very character of the Jewish religion is central to the argument. Here the prophetic literature is portrayed as a revolutionary break away from the Old Testament and the Jews along with the Greeks as the starting point and main propelling agency of modern civilization. The contrast between the ancient Chinese and Egyptians viewed as unable to progress for want of mental liberty and individuality and a comparatively insignificant oriental people, the Jews. 
Their religion enabled persons of genius and a high religious tone to be regarded and to regard themselves as inspired from heaven, giving existence to an inestimable, precious, unorganized institution. The order, if it may be so termed, of prophets, alongside the monarchy and priesthood, an antagonism of influence, a sort of balance of power, which is the only real security for continued progress. Religion, consequently, was not there what it had been in so many places, a, a consecration of all that was once established and a barrier against further progress. And as I'll explain, this kind of a perspective on religion was applied to contemporary Christianity. But Salvador, Mill affirmed, did not go far enough. Though valid, his identification of the prophets with the modern freedom of the press did not convey an adequate conception of the part fulfilled in national and universal history by this great element of Jewish life, by means of which the canon of inspiration never being complete, the person most eminent in genius and moral feeling could not only denounce and reprobate with the direct authority of the Almighty whatever appeared to them deserving of such treatment, but could give forth better and higher interpretation of the national religion, which henceforth became part of the religion. Now, a divorce of the prophets from the earlier biblical works is a main theme, and accordingly, he writes, whoever can divest himself of the habit of reading the Bible as if it was one book, which until lately was equally inveterate in Christians and in unbelievers, sees with admiration the vast interval between the morality and religion of the Pentateuch, or even of the historical books, and the morality and religion of the prophecies, a distance as wide as between these last and the Gospels. Conditions more favorable to progress could not easily exist Accordingly, the Jews, instead of being stationary like other Asiatics, were next to the Greeks the most progressive people of antiquity and jointly with them have been the starting point and main propelling agency of modern cultiva uh, cultivation. By the way, this is a rather wonderful fact. That I'll, it's too late to, to be frightened of anyone of anyone taking umbrage is what I'm going to say, but it's taken me a long time to, to divest myself of the habit of reading the Bible as if it was one book. <laughs> it's, only, it's only very recently <laughs> in the Holy Land that I've been able to uh, ar arrive at that level. A more enthusiastic accolade for the Jewish contribution to civilization is difficult to imagine. True, the allusion to a sharp break in ethical progress between the prophets and the gospels implies that the prophets did not go far enough, but there was much more to be done. Yet the fact is that in a range of informal and formal contexts dating from 1835 onwards, Mill questioned whether the gospels indeed pervade a peculiarly Christian morality. I'm going to cut down some of this material, but I'll do my best to retain the essence. Now, you'll know that in the system of logic, Judaism is famously perceived as merely a stage in human development as a, in a sequence entailing polytheism, Judaism, Christianity, Protestantism, and the critical philosophy of modern Europe and its positive science each stage perceived as a primary agent in making society what it was at each successive period. For all that, we yet find affirmed in On Liberty, as in the paper on Sedgwick in 1835, a denial of anything like a complete doctrine of Christian morals. The New Testament amounting to a sort of wishful thinking seeking unsuccessfully to go beyond Old Testament morality. It's in this context, actually, that the, we encounter the representation of the Old Testament as a barbarous production. You, you, you recall, Mill asked, how is it possible that there can have been any advance if people are, keep are referring continually to the Old Testament? And actually, in the case of St. Paul, accommodating Greek and Roman doctrine, including slavery. What follows uh, in On Liberty certainly undermines the representation 
which is given in Auguste Comte of Christianity as the highest form of monotheism, and indeed negates any notion of ethical progress over the centuries up until Mill's day. Christian morality, so-called, has all the characters of a reaction in it. It is, in great part, a protest against paganism. Its ideal is negative rather than positive, passive rather than active, innocence rather than nobleness, abstinence from <coughs> evil rather than energetic pursuit of good. In its precepts, as has been well said, thou shalt not predominates unduly over thou shalt. But there is in addition Mill's own vision of a good society reflected in the charge that Christianity encouraged self-interest at the cost of social concern, its standard of ethics amounting to no more than passive obedience. These charges against Christianity actually correspond to those directed at the old school of political economy, namely opposition to social reform on grounds of the sanctity of the laissez-faire principle and of pleasing the powers that be by lending the sanction of science to all established institutions and customs, unless indeed customs of the poor. In other words, an apologetic religion. And on liberty carries yet further the denial of anything <coughs> mounting to a purely Christian contribution to the idea of public spirit. What little recognition the idea of obligation to the public obtains in modern morality, Mill writes, is derived from Greek and Roman sources, not from Christian as even in the morality of private life, whatever exists of magnanimity, high-mindedness, personal dignity, even the sense of honor is derived from the purely human, not the religious part of our education, and never could have grown out of the standard of ethics in which the only worth professedly recognized is that of obedience. In conclusion, Mill declared it can do truth no service to blink the fact that a large portion of the noblest and most valuable moral teaching has been the work not only of men who did not know, but of men who knew and rejected the Christian faith. I'm not sure who he's referring to there. By the way, what I've just said is not my opinion, I'm recording Mill's opinion. Now, <clears throat> I turn from Mill's perspective on the historical development of ethical standards or lack of development to matters relating to contemporary policy. Firstly, parliamentary reform. <coughs> In 1834, Mill designated as a parliamentary monstrosity the stance adopted in the House of Lords by Edward Grey in rejecting an Edinburgh petition for the removal of Jewish civil disabilities. Mill remarks that uh, the so-called Socinians, the Socinians denied the divinity of Jesus, the Trinity, and explained sin and salvation rationalistically. Now, the Socinians had the right to vote. They were tolerated by the legislature. And Gray wrote that he held them in utter abhorrence, but at least they believed Jesus to be the Messiah, while the Jews affirmed the Lord Jesus Christ to be an imposter. So there was absolutely no right for the Jews to have the right to vote. Mill protested strongly, protect us from such Christianity. If this be the figure under which Christianity is to continue to be exhibited by its recognized teachers, there needs no profit to predict that as the religion of the people of this, this country, it will not last two more generations. The religion which men shall ever again reverence and shape their lives by will be, Dr. Gray may depend on it, another kind of religion than this. In this defense of the Jews, we have an early affirmation by Mill that there were no valid religious grounds for maintaining the political disabilities imposed on members of the Jewish faith. In further comments, uh, Mill denounced the rejection of the Lords of the Jewish Emancipation Bill for the relief of His Majesty's subjects professing the Jewish religion, and now extended his criticisms to rejection of two further proposals from the lower house, a bill to remove certain disabilities which prevent some classes of His Majesty's subjects from resorting to the universities, which of course included Jewish subjects, and a bill to abolish the Irish tithe. Mill's case regarding the first two is made out on grounds of the principle of civil equality and religious liberty 
in line with the June article relating to the universities. Civil equality and religious liberty. Now Mill's firm support for the removal of Jewish political disabilities remained unqualified in 1848 and again in 1849. Lord John Russell's Jewish Disabilities Bill designed to admit Jews to Parliament was turned back by the House of Lords. Writing to Harriet Taylor, Mill protested, did you notice that Russell, in bringing forward his Jew bill, although he is actually abolishing the old oaths and framing new, still has, still has the meanness to reinsert the words on the true faith of a Christian for all persons except Jews and justifies it by saying that the Constitution ought not avowedly to admit unbelievers into Parliament. This is not a remark hostile to the release of Jews from an oath impeding their entry into the legislature. On the contrary, it's rather a protest at the refusal to extend the release to all and sundry. The matter was elaborated anonymously in an article for one of the newspapers entitled The Attempt to Exclude Unbelievers from Parliament, summarized by Mill as declaring, in writing to Harriet, as declaring without mincing the matter that infidels are perfectly proper persons to be in Parliament. And five years later, Mill reaffirmed his support for the removal of the restrictions on the Jews. He says that the writer of one of the leading articles in today's Morning Post has evidently come hot from reading the logic, and I'm sorry to say, did no credit as a pupil, for it was an article against the Jew Bill. Um, one of the issues at stake was the compatibility of Judaism with a sterling English character. This was denied by one of the writers, and Mill, of course, rejected this perspective. Mill's support for secular public education is based on exactly the same considerations as those for the removal of Jewish political disabilities, civil equality and religious liberty. He says that to know the laws of the physical world, the properties of their own bodies and minds, the past history of their species is as much a benefit to the Jew, the Muslim, the deist, the atheist, as to the orthodox churchman, and it is iniquitous to hold it from them. Education provided by the public must be education for all, and to be education for all, it must be purely secular education in order to protect minorities. As for public education limited to believers in New Testament doctrine, the Jew and the unbeliever would be excluded from it, though they would not be the less required to pay for it. I do not hear that their money is to be refused, that they are to be exempted from the school rate. Religious exclusion and inequality are as odious, he wrote, when practiced towards minorities as majorities. There is in fact one case where Mill justifies particular protection of Jewish religious sensibilities. I have in mind his position in On Liberty regarding Sabbatarian legislation a category that might seem less important than voting rights and public education, but which strikingly confirms the absence of hostile bias on Mill's part in practical application. Thus, the state should, in its Sabbatarian legislation, protect the sanctity of Saturday for Jews, whereas any other day might be selected as a day of rest for non-Jews. He says, without doubt, abstinence on one day in the week, so far as the exigencies of life permit, from the usual daily occupations, though in no respect religiously binding on any except Jews, is a highly beneficial custom. So um, I think we can put pay to, to Alexander, but let me summarize and then um, think of this speech as um, my, my rabbi used to say that before before he spoke, he'll say a few words. <laughs> well, I've now finished saying a few words, <laughs> and I'm going to begin my speech. Um, my speech is a cur current application, not to worry too much, a current application of million principles, but I'll summarize what I've said so far. The notion that Mill was prejudiced against Jews Judaism 
turns in large part on his observations regarding the historical progression of ethical standards. The progression I've shown was subject to major qualifications. Thus his declamations regarding primitive Old Testament doctrine, based upon a regrettably partial familiarity with the text, I think, are effectively outweighed by admiration for the prophetic institution represented as protecting freedom of critical expression against perceived injustices as essential to assure their correction and thus guaranteeing or helping progress. In any event, it is clear that several of his hostile remarks relating to religion are directed at Christian rather than Jewish targets. Certainly the charges against Christianity of lack of social concern and endemic conservatism had profound consequences for the broadest range of contemporary social issues. Furthermore, Mill's understanding of ancient Jewish history in no way deflected him from the principle of equality implying protection of Jewish civil rights in contemporary England on a par with those of other minorities. The abolition of Jewish political disabilities is a prime case in point, Mill opposing Russell's exclusion of Jews from the Christian oath for entry into Parliament only because it discriminated against other non-Christians, including atheists and agnostics. The case for non-denominational public education is similarly based on the principle of equality. And particularly significant is evidence of a fearless objectivity is the argument for recognition of Saturday as the day of rest for Jews on specifically religious grounds, although not of Sunday for non-Jews. Here, satisfaction of the principle of equality is seen as justifying a special case, uh, in, in special cases, a sort of positive um, discrimination. Now, now I come to my speech. <laughs> Recall Thomas Arnold's crude lambasting in 1834 of that low Jacobinical notion of citizenship, I refer to it at the beginning, that a man acquires a right to it by the accident of his being littered into quatuor maria or because he pays taxes. He happens to have been born in a particular state and therefore he has the right to a vote or because he pays taxes gives him the right to the vote. This he regarded as low left-wing philosophy. Arnold did. And it's precisely a Jacobinical notion of citizenship which Mill upheld to the benefit of the Jewish minority in his time and which I feel certain he would apply today to the benefit of other minorities. Honest critics of policy on the part of the government of, modern, of the modern Jewish state should therefore feel free to appeal to Mill in good conscience. Now, ethical objections to discrimination are, of course, strengthened where inequality in the treatment of majority of the majorities by the minority or where the two parties are roughly balanced in numbers is at issue. And Mill indeed appropriately extended his case in effect. And a concept to be noted here of national morality is of the essence in his treatment of British colonial rule in Ireland and India. And just in brackets, I'd like to mention that David Ricardo would have understood this notion of national morality. I can actually, I won't do it today, but I could cite, I could cite, um, I could cite verse to prove that Ricardo would have understood what is meant by national morality. So, but it is, in fact, an extremely difficult concept to, to grasp. As for Ireland, Mill considered reducing unrest in Ireland by improving the lot of the Irish including a variety of land reforms, but recognizes what he calls a desperate form of dissatisfaction, which does not demand to be better governed, which asks us for no benefit, no redress of grievances, not even any reparation of injuries, but simply to take ourselves off and rid the country of our presence. That is a revolt of mere nationality. He himself could not have believed that the situation had quite reached that stage since he put much weight on institutional reform as a last resort to save the Union. Only in its absence would Britain be forced, and rightly so, to abandon Ireland. And he writes as follows, It is not consistent with self-respect in a nation any more than an individual 
to wait till it is compelled by uncontrollable circumstances to resign that which it cannot in conscience hold, before allowing its government to involve it in the attempt to maintain dominion over Ireland by brute force, the English nation ought to commune with its conscience and, and solemnly reconsider its position. If England is unable to learn what has to be learned and unlearn what has to be unlearned in order to make her rule willingly acceptable by the Irish people, are we the power which according to the general fitness of things and the rules of morality ought to govern Ireland? If so, what are we dreaming of when we give our sympathy to the Poles, the Italians, the Hungarians, the Servians, the Greeks, and I know not how many other oppressed nationalities? As for India, the following extract from represented government is written with an eye to the East India Company. I stress the qualification that I'll read in a moment, that if the good of the governed is the proper business of a government, then the government of one people by another does not and cannot exist. He says that the government of a people by itself has a meaning and a reality, but such a thing as a government of one people by another does not and cannot exist. One people may keep another as a warren of, or preserve for its own use, a place to make money in, a human cattle farm, to be worked for the profit of its own inhabitants. But if the good of the governed is the proper business of a government, it is utterly impossible that a people should directly attend to it. The utmost they can do is to give some of their best men a commission to look after it, to whom the opinion of their own country can neither be much of a guide in the performance of their duty, nor a comp competent judge of the mode in which it has been performed. Now, <clears throat> since eight, 1967, Israel has exercised rule over a subject people making use of administrative, legal, police and military regulations, much of which inherited from mandatory times when Britain was the occupying power. In some respects, matters are worse than Mill would have feared. Public opinion in Israel apparently has no patience with million liberal principles, which is scarcely surprising since the attitudes of administrators, police, soldiers and settlers generally in the territories naturally affect the perspectives of residents within the Green Line. For the most part, these are in fact overlapping groups. But beyond this, there is no appeal allowed Palestinians to independent commissioners, divorced from Israeli public opinion, of the sort Mill believed was provided by the East India Company concerned with Indian welfare. <coughs> now, I must here underscore the fact that Mill's Jacobinism is expressed loud and clear in Israel's own Declaration of Independence, in the famous clause stating that the Jewish state will ensure complete equality of social and political rights to all its inhabitants, irrespective of religion, race or sex. The now widespread condemnation as traitors to the Jewish state or as fifth columnists of critics concerned with perceived deviations from this principle laid down in the Declaration of Independence amounts, as I see it, to a rejection of the founding document. Worse still, the principle of non-discrimination is explicitly traced in the Declaration to the Prophets of Israel, so that if we accept Mill's view of the prophetic institution as one establishing the right to denounce and reprobate under religious auspices into the bargain, it follows that those who would silence criticism of the Jewish state do so in the name of a sadly impoverished version of the Jewish faith. And, and quite frankly, they should be careful before they bandy around words such as treachery directed against the critics. I owe John Stuart Mill a great debt for clarifying the issues for me. But what of the future? At one point he says the ideal situation for an occupying power is to so regulate the governance that they will be training the native inhabitants to become fit for self-government. It's too late for that. So what is to be done? Were he with us, Mill might perhaps propose making Israeli rule palatable to Palestinians by offering social benefits equivalent to those enjoyed by the Jewish residents, or as he wrote of Ireland, 
undertaking institutional reform to remove from the minds of the Irish people the bitterness which has been produced by our previous mode of government. This option might not, however, sat suffice to satisfy Palestinian national aspirations, what Mill calls the revolt of mere nationality, unless civil, full civil rights are granted, which of course includes the right of representation in Parliament. After all, Mill applied the greatest happiness principle to a national entity which includes an Irish component to be treated on strictly equal terms with its British counterpart. But this is academic. No Israeli government would contemplate the loss of a Jewish majority or even roughly equal weighting in a bi-national state. And when I say no Israeli government, I mean the most left-wing conceivable of Israeli governments, including, say, the Meretz party and including uh, Aretz newspaper, which are both, we can call, uh, Jacobinical uh, um, forces. They, they, they wouldn't accept such an outcome. On the other hand, the present policy of extending settlement to render irreversible what already amounts to de facto annexation, with Palestinians denied civil rights, the kind of situation that Thomas Arnold had, had in mind, um, in, 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 in the parallel case, and increasingly, politicians in Israel feel confident enough to state this intention openly and aggressively. Uh, <clears throat> then the result must surely end with Israel's exclusion from the community of Western nations. Now, th this is an empty threat. I'm not so naive as to believe that th this, this is a meaningful threat at all. Um, it wouldn't bother Mill's ideological enemies one whit if Israel was in fact excluded from the community of Western nations. In fact, divorce from the West is a desideratum. Democratic institutions are anathema to them. And uh, unfortunately, they, they, they live with rather unsavory bedfellows. So it, it's all very, very upsetting. Uh, the author of a system of logic would, I conclude, feel obliged to opt for a two-state solution. I say a two-state solution rather than the two-state solution in order to allow for some form of confederation rather than a clean break. Unfortunately, since logic is a scarce commodity in my part of the world, I fear more of the same. Unless, unless the national conscience suddenly awakens from its stupor, or maybe um, Donald Trump has something to suggest. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>